Good morning. New York is a city of contrasts. And just seven miles from here in the community of Brownsville in Brooklyn is a radically different neighborhood. Brownsville is a place of tremendous promise and potential, but just 19% of students perform at grade level in reading and math. It has among the lowest performing school systems in the city. Among adults 25 years and older, one in four does not have a high school diploma. And only one in five uh, adults have a college degree. This at a time when jobs not requiring college and playing, paying a living wage are simply vanishing. College has become, of course, the ticket to a middle class life. At the same time, Brownsville has the second highest incarceration rate in the city. On some city blocks, more than a million dollars a year is spent to incarcerate that block's residents. This is the school to prison pipeline. And to arrest this pipeline, I think is going to require much more than tinkering minor incremental improvements to the school system over the course of years, if not decades. We need radically better schools right now, radically different schools. And that's why I started Ascend Learning. Ascend is a network of nonprofit charter schools in central Brooklyn that aim to provide a reliable path to and through college for the students of central Brooklyn. We have 10 schools today, 4,300 students in grades K through 11, soon grade 12. Uh, and the idea is that these are schools that are open to all students, no admission requirements, no fees, no tuition, publicly funded at levels lower than the existing public school systems. And so we began with Ascend, basing our approach on a schooling model called No Excuses. No Excuses arose in the first 10 years of the charter movement in response to the conditions in many urban schools where students were disaffected, the settings were often chaotic, even violent, and students weren't learning and were alienated and often dropped out. And so No Excuses came up with a radically different proposal. The central premise, as inhabited in the name, is that we would stop making excuses for why students aren't learning. No longer would we blame families, social conditions, not having, not having enough money, and a thousand other things. Not because these social problems weren't incredibly important and had to be resolved, but because we would no longer state that they were a precondition to getting better results. And the idea was that in No Excuses Schools, we would do whatever it takes to see every student through to high achievement. And early networks like KIPP that are familiar to us posted remarkable academic results. So we set off on the same path. But about two years ago, we looked around and we asked, how is this really going? We had some of the highest scores. So in uh, ELA tests, English Language Arts, under the Common Core exams, we posted some of the strongest results in Brooklyn of charter schools. But when we went into the rooms, and we felt the rooms. Where was the joy? Where was the intellectual passion that we were seeking to create? It just wasn't there. We also had low teacher retention, and the model seemed to be working for some students, but not for all, especially for many boys. And we saw a flagrant contradiction. On the one hand, we were seeking to develop the voice, the intellectual confidence of our students, their ability to think critically, at the same time, we were acquiring, in many ways, their silence. Silent hallways, silent transitions, so much focus on compliance, sweating the small stuff so we don't sweat the big stuff. And we said, is this who we really want to be? So we decided to take it all out. Any remnant, any echo of the criminal justice system would be removed. And instead, we put in place a model based in the lower grades on what's called responsive classroom which is an approach widely used in suburban and affluent schools, and in the upper grades, a model called restorative practices. So responsive classroom seeks in every room to create a warm, joyful setting where the teacher deeply knows every child and where students learn social and emotional skills like cooperation and trust and empathy. And in the upper grades, in high school, when there's a serious disciplinary incident, the students come together in a circle 
and they try to understand the deep cause of the problem. It's not punishments, it's cause and solution. They determine a solution and they make amends to one another. So a very different approach. So it's still early, but two years in, here's what's happening. Suspensions are down by 90% in many of our lower schools. No longer do we have suspension rooms. No longer do we have the kind of quiescent tension between adults and students that never quite goes away. And this has not come because we have decided to look the other way and tolerate disruptive behaviors that we once wouldn't have permitted. On the contrary, the place is more joyful and the behavior is better. It also hasn't come at the expense of academic achievement because results are way up. In our high school last year, we had exactly one suspension all year and we posted some of the highest region scores of charter schools in the city. Across all of our schools, despite the fact that our students come 84% from poverty, our students are outperforming the state average. So we think of the work of Joanne Golan, a sociologist in Princeton. She has written extensively of no excuses schooling and she observes that these are schools that are, have as their intention to promote class mobility. But at the same time, they unwittingly perpetuate the very behaviors that they seek to change. The tendency of students to monitor themselves, not state their opinions, defer to authority. Whereas in affluent schools or middle class schools, the qualities that are cultivated are creativity and independence and assertiveness to prepare students for middle class and managerial roles. So it's early, we're only just beginning. We hope to expand our model in the next years to twice the size to really create a demonstration of what might be possible with 10,000 students. But we can say, we're asking, I think, the important questions. We're saying, can an education that benefits students from a middle class setting, an ambitious, rich liberal education where students learn Shakespeare in fifth grade and the scientific method and learn to debate and can then go to the seminar table in college and thrive confident of their views, can this work just as well for students from underserved communities? And we think the answer is yes. And we'd love to have you come and visit our schools. Thank you very much.